Welcome back to the Miami Book Fair. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS NewsHour. Really delighted now to welcome to our set John Grisham to talk about his latest novel, The Reckoning. Welcome to you. Glad to be here. This book takes us back to a mythical town in Mississippi that you wrote about a long time ago. Why go back? Well, it's uh, the, 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 a lot of good stories there. Yeah. A lot of good, uh, a lot of uh, colorful people, a lot of good stories. And uh, when I started writing, I had no idea what I was doing. My plan was to write a book from Ford County, it's Time to Kill, and publish that, and mm -hmm. then write a legal thriller. Yeah. Uh, and then go back to Ford County and alternate back and forth and back and forth. And it didn't work out that way. Uh, well, it worked out okay. It worked out okay. Yeah. The success of the firm really uh, sort of convinced me to, to pursue legal thrillers for the next 20 years. Right. And so I did right. uh, before I ever went back. But that, that's kind of where I'm from. I know the area very well and yeah. enjoy those stories more. So in, that, in a case like that, you have this grounding in a particular time and, and place. Right. Yeah. And how much does that, so you started with that grounding? This was difficult because it's the only book I've written that took place before I was born, hmm. in the late 1940s, mid-40s, World War II. And uh, it was very difficult to, to research what life was like in the rural South back then. I remember it through my grandparents and parents. They were mm -hmm. farmers in Arkansas, and I remember how they lived, mm -hmm. but they've been gone for a long time, my grandparents. My parents died a few years ago. I didn't have that resource to, to call my dad and say, hey, how many televisions were there in your hometown in 1947? Yeah. Probably one or two. Who had, who had, the, te who had the first television? Mm -hmm. How many telephones were there? Did you have indoor plumbing? Stuff like that, that I really uh, had to research and to, to, to get the texture and feel of the, the way that people live. How'd you do it? Well, a lot of research, uh, other books, other novels. Yeah. I read a couple of Faulkner novels that he wrote in the 1940s. Uh, you read, read, I mean, I assume you read Faulkner a long time before. Well, if you're a Mississippi guy. Yeah, you grow up in Mississippi, there's a state law that says you have to read Faulkner when you're a junior in high school. Right. Say the law somewhere, because every high school English teacher forces Faulkner on us. <laughs> and uh, they all think they can teach and sound in the fury, but no, no one can. Uh, so I grew up with it. And yeah. uh, for that reason, tend to stay away from it. But it's really good. When Faulkner's good, he's, he's good about describing the way people lived yeah. uh, in the rural South. And yeah. so... Did some a little bit of fault, but not much. Much goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> this is also a, a bigger story than than many others that you've written. I mean, this is we're talking about this particular time and place, but it also goes through time and much larger. Yeah, geographically. I did something I've never done before. Yeah. Uh, in the context of a, I guess a legal thriller. We start off with a murder, mm -hmm. arrest, uh, criminal prosecution, the trial. A looming ex execution, you know, that's my sweet spot, okay? That's what I like to write about. Yeah. And then suddenly when that's over in part one, the book takes a hard left turn and goes off to World War II, to the Philippines, yeah. and the Bataan Death March, because our hero, as it turns out, our anti-hero, <laughs> what you want to call him, yeah. the murderer, the defendant, uh, went off to fight in the war. Right. And they provided so much backdrop for the story, and it's all kind of complicated and convoluted until the very last page. Yeah. So, the, so just to fill in for the people who haven't read it yet, so the, the anti-hero you're talking about, we learn right away he's committed a murder. Yeah. He's a war hero. He's just back from, the war, from World War II. He kills a very popular, uh, prominent minister. minister. His, his minister, the guy, right. the, the Methodist minister at his church right. where his grandfather built. And he uh, drove to town one day and went to the pastor's office and pulled out a gun and shot him three times. And, and he drove back home and uh, sat on the front porch and waited for the sheriff to come get him. And he did. And he yeah. said, the murder weapon's in my truck over there. Yeah. And so the sheriff takes him to town, and uh, the sheriff, he knows the sheriff well. Yeah. And the sheriff said, Pete, what's going on? He said, I have nothing to say. Yeah. And his lawyer, he, you know, he was prominent. He had lawyers. So his, his chief lawyer came to jail right then. To, he couldn't know the town couldn't believe that their war hero, their favorite son, had murdered uh, a popular minister. Yeah. And the lawyer said, uh, Pete, what do you, why? He said, I have nothing to say. And he said nothing until the very end. I heard that you, uh, is it correct that this is a story you heard a long time ago? Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. It, uh, I think it's true. Yeah. I don't know. I can't verify it. Yeah. I think it took place in Mississippi in the 1930s. That's the way the version I heard. Right. Uh, there are, everybody's dead now, so I'm not sure who's going to verify yeah. it, but I've asked people. Yeah. Uh, if, you ever, if you've heard this story, 
uh, please get in touch with me. I want to verify it. Because the guy who told the story 30 years ago, the, the version I heard. Yeah. But this uh, is back when you're a lawyer. In, I was a 32-year-old yeah. state representative in the, yeah. in, at the state capitol in Jackson. Right. And we, we had a lot of downtime. And so we had all these wonderful politicians and storytellers from all corners of the state who yeah. you know, campaigned and knew how to talk and knew how to tell stories. And so we'd take turn telling stories. I, as a freshman member, I was not allowed to speak, but they couldn't say much because the old guys were the storytellers. Mm -hmm. And they're fabulous stories, just yeah. wonderful stories. I, I wish I'd written them all down, but this one stuck. Why did it stick? I mean, the, the, especially this phrase, I have nothing to say, yeah. right? He admits he did it. There's no question about the who done it. Yeah. But there's the why that he just doesn't want to talk about. That's why it's a great story, because uh, the truth was never known. There was speculation that it involved his wife, mm -hmm. but he would never say that because he did not want to damage her honor, yeah. impugn her reputation. Right. So he took it to his grave. So the pleasure for you as a writer was what? You were filling in the story. Embellishing, to fill in all, yeah, all the, the backstory. Write the backstory. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I did. Uh, you can tell the story in about five minutes. You know, it took me a long time to write it and all the subplots and characters. And that's what is so enjoyable about writing is, is when you get a good story and watching it develop and unfold and it sort of comes to life and uh, I'm just along for the ride. I mean, I love that. So, I mean, that's true of most stories, right? You can tell it in five minutes, the plot. You better be able to pitch a story pretty fast. Yeah. Because if you have to go on and on and on, it's probably too complicated. Right. You know, it, it's not like a TV series or a movie or whatever, but you better, you better be able to, whatever your story is, you better be able to pitch it verbally to somebody who, who, who can listen to you yeah. and say, this is a great idea I have for a story. What do you, what do you think about this story? I do it all the time to my wife and uh, I have for 30 years and, you know, she listens and sometimes she likes it, sometimes she doesn't. When you're writing about 1940s, 50s Mississippi, you're inevitably writing about race, yeah. period of segregation, which you get into here. You, you often in your books, I think, write about and get into social thing, issues that yeah. interest isn't the right word, does it seem important to you? Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yes. I'm always searching for a story about an issue whether legal, but I live in the legal world. I'm, yeah. st I'm still a lawyer. I don't practice anymore, but yeah. I think like a lawyer. And, and I love stories about trials and law firms and lawyers and judges and courts and appeals and cases and trends and litigation and mm -hmm. law firms that blow up and all, you know, that's, that's, that's where I like to, that's what I like to read. Yeah. And, but also issues involving uh, criminal justice and especially injustice yeah. with wrongful convictions and the death penalty and, mass incarceration, our, our for-profit prisons, and all these problems that we yeah. have yeah. Uh, that we could fix if we would simply do it, but they, they still trouble me. And, and when I find a good story uh, with a legal setting, you know, I write it down. I write the note down. I, I save the magazine article. I, I make a note somewhere in my computer. This, this could be a story one day. So it's a constant process. But is it, is it the issue that interests you first, and then you find the story to go with it? Both ways. Both ways. Both ways. Sometimes, sometimes my wife will say, "Just stop preaching. Get off your soapbox and go write another yeah. firm." The, yeah. Just a good, a good story of, of uh, suspense, legal intrigue, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 stop preaching for a while. And, and I'll do that. You can't, you can't, you can't impose your politics on your readers because it becomes sort of intrusive. You know, you you, you don't want to do that. You don't want to assume everybody's got the same politics. Uh, so I, I stay away from it a lot. It is mm -hmm. fun just to write a good old fashioned thriller, yeah. suspense novel, yeah. without the le the heavy legal issues. We, as you were sitting down, we were talking about place you live, Charlottesville, mm -hmm. wonderful small city with lots going on, but hit the national consciousness in a way that you said surprised you when they, the uh, yeah. alt right marched through. Yeah, we knew it was coming because there was, they had to get a parade permit. They had a, a, a per permit to have the rally. It was in the newspapers. The downtown merchants were debating whether or not they should remain open mm -hmm. that Saturday, uh, August 12th of last year. Should, mm -hmm. you know, what should we do? The police thought, thought they were ready. The city thought it was ready. The university thought it was ready. Uh, so we, we didn't get ambushed. We knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. What we did not realize was that these, 
the alt-right people were so well organized, they came from 35 states and just picked Charlottesville. And th there's some pretty tough guys on the left, too. Yeah. And these two groups had been wanting to fight for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so it just so happened they all showed up in Charlottesville at the same time mm -hmm. and brawled for a couple of days in the streets. of and Then they went home. So when they went home, we're back downtown where we live and work every day, eating in outdoor cafes and thinking, what happened? Why, mm. why did it happen to us here in Charlottesville? It's a very tolerant, open-minded community, mm -hmm. and it's a university town. Mm -hmm. We've been there for 25 years. It's a great place to live. We don't have those problems. Mm -hmm. I've never been a, a, a Nazi or a white supremacist in Charlottesville. So, uh, you know, we kind of got... We're still kind of scratching our heads. And yeah. But Charlottesville has become a buzzword for something that's bad, you know, the, this, this, this riot that happened. And, uh, you know, we feel like we didn't, we didn't deserve that. That's not something that we asked for. Although others would say we did because the city council did vote to remove, remove the monuments. Right. And that's what triggered Charlottesville as a, right. as a place right. uh, to, to show up and protest. Now I'm curious, I mean, is that kind of thing something that might interest you to write? Does that, you know, work its way into your well, sensibility as a writer? That'd be a tough one, but it'd be hard to find a plot. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be difficult to find a plot that would work. There have been... Uh, several criminal prosecutions since yeah. then. Right. Some folks are spending time now yeah. for assault and things like that. Uh, the big trial, there was one uh, young lady who was killed. That's going to be a murder trial coming up uh, fairly soon. Right. So there are, there are a lot of legal issues. And, and I've, you know, again, I've learned over the years, don't try to predict where the next story is going to come from. Yeah. Something can happen tomorrow. And I, I would become obsessed with it and write that book. Most of them take a long time to play out, but you never know where the next great idea is coming from. What what made you want to be a writer in the first place? I was really tired of practicing law. <laughs> I didn't do it for long, yeah. 10 years. Yeah. But about halfway through that career, as young as I was, um, I was kind of dissatisfied with it. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to play around with some fiction. And yeah, but why fiction? I mean, there are lots of other things one could turn to. I had a story. Could you could you could play golf every day or something? I mean, if you saw me play golf, you would know that I would never make a dime playing golf. Okay. Um, I had a story. I had a great story that became a time to kill, mm -hmm. and I something I saw one day in court, and I said I'm going to take that story and change this and change that and make it a very compelling yeah. courtroom drama in a small town in Mississippi. So I became obsessed with the story that became a time to kill. Yeah. I, I, I read that you were given some early advice for, about publishing regularly or once a year or, yeah? I'd never thought about it. I'd never thought about uh, publishing every year, but when The Firm came out in March of 91 now, uh, it became popular, found, found an audience. And I was back in New York kind of for the victory lap, doing the, you know, the yeah. morning shows. And yeah. it, was, it was a big deal, it was a right. very heady time for for me and uh, just to, just hard to believe that, you know, that this was actually happening. And yeah. a, uh, a young editor just made an offhanded comment over lunch. He said, well, the big guys come out every year. Look the big the, guys, the big... The big guys. Writers. The big writers. Yeah. He said, look at the lists. You got Tom Clancy, Stephen King, Michael Crichton. These yeah. guys come out every year. Mm -hmm. The key to it is to do it every year for a while. I, I, I never realized that. I never thought about that. And... Um, but for, it stuck. And I'd started my, my third book, The Pelican Brief, and I was, I hurried back home and, and quit touring. And I said, okay, I'm gonna finish this book and publish it next year. And, and we got it done in a hurry. And that, that got it started. 25 years later, I still do it once a year. So, so what is that? Is that, is that a discipline or, a, I mean, what allows you to do that? Find the stories and write the stories. I think a hyperactive imagination uh, with an eye for a story, always looking and always looking for the story. Yeah. And then once I have the story, there's a, there's a fair amount of discipline yeah. involved. I, it's not really hard work. I, mean, I don't work 40 hours a week. I haven't in 30 years. You don't? No. 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 How many? How many? <laughs> not many. <laughs> a typical day, I'll write four hours in the morning and, um, yeah. and go to the office, then another office, and spend two or three hours doing the business end of it. And so it's not a it's not a full. Yeah. I can take off whenever I want to. And so it's not a yeah. real job. I'm very lucky. <laughs> I'm very lucky. I mean, you were just talking about how surprised you were when the the firm came and that exploded your world. 
are you, I assume you're surprised by what you've been able to do over these years, decades. Yeah, I don't take it for granted. It's still fun. It's still, uh, at times, hard to believe. It's still, still things happen to me every day. And I, I remember the days as a starving lawyer when I was 30 years old, mm -hmm. a long time ago in Mississippi, and dreaming of uh, a big case or, or a big settlement or something to get my feet on the ground. And, yeah. and I, I, I still remember those days. Somehow there's a, that, that endless fascination with the tri the justice system and process, right? Never went away. We're Americans. I mean, We're Americans. We have, we have this insatiable appetite for stories about the law and lawyers and crime and, you know, police detective sh stories. And we, we just, you know, and also litigation. We have, a, we have a compulsion for litigation that is unmatched anywhere in the world. Yeah. We, we have so many rights that we either really have or we think that we have as Americans, and we love our, the rights that we cherish. And if somebody does something to tamper with a right that we think we yeah. have, uh, we're not going to take it. You know, we're going to call a lawyer. We're going to file a lawsuit. We're going to do something because yeah. we want justice. That's just the American way. That's, that's in our DNA. And that leads to a lot of great stories. Yeah. If you know where to look. If you know where to look. Headlines. All right. The new novel is The Reckoning. John Grisham, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. And do stay with us here in Miami. I'm Jeffrey Brown. We'll be right back.